On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and our friends at Third Place Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our presentation with Liz Carlisle, Latrice Tatsi, and Halil Akohawk. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We are so glad to have you join us today. The presentation will run about 60 minutes, including Q&A. To submit your question for the Q&A portion of the event, please enter meet.ps forward slash Carlisle or scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone. We'll drop this link in the chat as well and you can submit a question at any time. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible and you can help us by keeping your own question concise. Also a reminder that if you'd like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Liz Carlisle's new book, Healing Grounds, Climate, Justice, and the Deep Roots of Regenerative Farming is the subject of tonight's talk. We know you'll want to dig deeper and purchase your own copy. If you are joining us here in the forum tonight, stop by the auto and pick up your own copy. Otherwise, use the link in the chat below to buy from our friends at Third Place Books. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors, including PCC Community Markets. As part of our Town Green and Arno G. Matolsky Science Series, this event is supported by Microsoft and the Hugh and Jane Ferguson Foundation. Town Hall is also a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members who are joining us tonight. If you share in their belief that our community is energized and empowered by considering questions of politics, science, and culture, consider supporting us by becoming a member. Now I'd like to welcome to the stage Keelan Everly Lang from PCC Community Markets to introduce tonight's guest. Keelan is a recruiter and store staffing specialist. She fosters strong community partnerships to create pathways to employment with an emphasis on inclusive practices. Keelan also trains and supports hiring managers at all 16 locations. The co-op is currently hiring for roles in the office and stores in a range of positions, including entry level and leadership opportunities. So be sure to connect with Keelan if you have any questions. Please join me in welcoming Keelan Everly Wang. Thank you, so I get to introduce our speakers today. Um, so Liz Carlisle is an assistant professor in the environmental studies program at UC Santa Barbara, where she teaches courses on food and farming. Born and raised in Montana, she got hooked on agriculture while working as an aide to organic farmer and US Senator John Tester, which led to a decade of research and writing collaborations with farmers in her home state. In addition to Healing Grounds, she has written two other books about regenerative farming and agroecology, Lentil Underground in 2015, and Grain by Grain in 2019 with co-author Bob Quinn. Prior to her career as a writer and an ap academic, she spent several years touring rural America as a country singer. Latrice Tatsi in Niskamaki is an ecologist and advocate for tribally directed bison restoration who remains active in her family's cattle ranching operation at Blackfeet Nation in Northwest Montana. Her research focuses on organic matter and carbon in soil, specifically the benefits to soil from the reintroduction of bison, or inni, to their traditional grazing landscapes on the Blackfeet Reservation. Latrice is currently completing her master's degree in land resources and environmental sciences at Montana State University, and she serves as a research fellow with the P. Connie Lodge Health Institute and the Wildlife Conservation Society. Hillel Echohawk, she, her, Pawnee and Athabascan, is an indigenous chef, caterer, and speaker, born and raised in the interior of Alaska around the Athabascan village of Mentasta, home to the matriarchal chief and subsistence rights activist, Katie John. Watching John and other indigenous peoples fight for food sovereignty, as well as seeing her mother strive to make healthy home-cooked meals for her and her six siblings, gave Hillel a unique perspective on diet and wellness. Echo Hawk is the owner of Birch Basket, her food and work has been featured in James Beard, Bon Appetit, Eater, HuffPost, National Geographic, PBS, Vogue, The Seattle Times, and many, many more. Please join me in welcoming Latrice Tatsi, Halil Echohawk, and Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much. Um, 
for the generous introduction and all the months of planning um, that went into us being here. And thanks everyone who's joining in the room and on Zoom. And I'm, I'm Liz, and I'm just so thrilled uh, to get to be in conversation with Latrice and Hillel, both of whom I admire deeply. I'm going to start with about a five minute reading from the beginning of this book, and then we're going to have a conversation, and we're going to invite you also to ask questions as part of that conversation. But to get us started, I want to begin here um, in many ways where I began, at the beginning of this book and at the beginning of, of the journey of this book, of the questions that I had about regenerative agriculture, about the potential for a farming system that could be a climate solution rather than a climate problem. And was it really possible to store carbon in the soil? And if so, how? And here's where I started. To my amazement, I found that practices commonly promoted within regenerative circles as new innovations had been used for many hundreds, and in some cases, thousands of years, not just in faraway ancient civilizations, but continuously and right here on the North American continent. Accompanying these practices were sophisticated analyses of soil health, as well as guidelines for stewarding it. Some of these regenerative farmers, though I came to understand them by other terms that they themselves used, were indigenous to these lands. Others had migrated here, bringing knowledge and seeds with them. But once I began learning to recognize the signature of their influence on the North American landscape, I started seeing it everywhere. In places that few agricultural researchers ventured to look, vacant lots, immigrant neighborhoods, Native American reservations, Regenerative agriculture kept periodically popping up like a desert super bloom after a spring rain. This left me with a pointed, haunting question. Why weren't these regenerative farmers more securely established? If putting down roots was the key to a climate-friendly food system, what was preventing these people with regenerative farming know-how from doing so? Or had they been uprooted? At this point, I realized that I needed to examine the story of US agriculture, a story I thought I knew through a lens other than my own. I became intensely curious about what farmers and communities of color might teach me about how to work toward healing on the land. When I asked the question this way, a rich landscape of regenerative agriculture began to come into view. I spoke with indigenous Montanans working to restore native prairie and bring home their bison relatives. I talked to returning generation black farmers reaching back to their African heritage to inform new agroforestry initiatives. A Chicana soil ecologist, herself the child of farm workers, showed me the results of her research with immigrant Mexican and Hmong farmers in California's Central Valley, whose highly diverse small farms were teeming with beneficial fungi. The more I learned, the more I came to see that regenerative agriculture was neither a relic nor a fantasy. It had always been here, but on the margins. Pushed to the edges of industrial agriculture, these practices had been sustained by people pushed to the edges of society. This was not just a story about regeneration, but also one about liberation, and the two were powerfully intertwined. As I learned from farmers, scholars, and advocates who had spent lifetimes digging into these stories, some of them looking into their own family's pasts, the regenerative farming traditions of their ancestors had been suppressed 
but never fully snuffed out. Carefully tended in the gardens of the enslaved and the murals of the landless, these traditions had provided both material subsistence and another form of sustenance that was difficult to put into words. There had been centuries of this survival work, seeds braided into hair and smuggled across borders, passed down generation to generation. Bison and their human relatives confined to reserves dreaming of reunion on their ancestral lands. Milpas on the edges of farm fields, New Year's meals of black-eyed peas, networks for sharing harvest labor. All these practices had persisted despite the confines of structural racism. Might this moment of climate crisis be their time to blossom? And I don't have the answer to that question, but these two women do. So I'm gonna invite Latrice and Hillel to join me on the stage for a conversation. <laughs> So we've heard your formal introductions, but I wonder if you would each like to, to briefly introduce yourselves and just tell us a little bit about the work that you do and, and where it comes from, maybe starting with Latrice. Oki, Nisunya Daniku, and Eskamaki, Buffalo Stone Woman, my Amskapi Pakani name, Latrice Tatsi, I call my government issued name. Um, so what really started my research is I was, I grew up on the back of a horse with my father. He was a rancher. He ran my grandma's cattle operation while she was an educator. And so having the opportunity to grow up on the back of a horse and have land-based learning opportunity as a young child and having my dad say, okay, we're going to go check this out and not really knowing what we were doing as a young child, but just knowing we were going to these places and as I got older, I, it built my curiosity. We go um, hunting in the mountains and I would see uh, people testing water and just getting samples and I'd always be like, Dad, what are they doing? He's like, you know, they're testing the water for how healthy it is. He said, you know, my, my girl, we're really lucky. Badger Creek, where we live, it's the cleanest water um, on the Blackfeet Nation. He said, so, you, you know, you'd be really thankful for where we live. And I was like, you know, what's even cooler is I know where those headwaters start in the mountains. And so, you know, I know exactly where my water comes from. And so having that, the background that I have had, I feel like, you know, it's, you're nurtured by your environment and you either take to it or you don't. And I took to it because then a curiosity of my background and my, my dad explaining, you know, our people did this for this reason and it started to explain things. And then as I got older, and learning about science, I was like, oh my gosh, I just love learning about science, you know, and the methodologies. And then as I start doing my own research in, you know, an undergrad and looking at what we consider the Blackfeet calendar stick and just starting to understand how our people understood systems and how that's applicable to today. And I was like, wow, our people were so smart and how they survived. Like our, our science is based in our culture. So then I was like, you know, dad, would it be okay if I start using the term cultural science because not only for our tribe, but for other people of color, their sciences are tied to their culture because of how they had to adapt to the lands that they used, utilized to survive. And so, you know, he was like, yeah, you know my girl, because like our medicine wheel, it's broken into four colors and it represents the people of this earth. So he was like, you know, you using that cultural science that's tied to them, I feel like it's okay. And so that's what really started my, my, my reaching out and this is what I wanted to study, but also tying it back to, to the knowledge base of where I come from and, and understanding why we practiced the, the ways that we did because it's tied not only to the, the, the physical, but also the spiritual relationship that we have. So that's a little bit about my background and why I do what I do. 
Thanks. That was awesome. I just want to hear you talk. Nawa kotakoka teira piti uatias. Hello, my name is Halela Kohak. Uh, I was born and raised in Alaska. Um, and how I started um, was I I have a very large family, like you've heard. I've um, uh, there were six. I have a total of seven siblings. Um, six of us grew up together, um, and we were always the family that everybody came over and ate with. We were always the family that um, uh, was always having people come stay with us, live with us. Um, we were we were that house, um, and just growing up, seeing that how my family, my parents. Um, really fostered that environment um, and made sure that everybody was welcome, everybody was fed, everybody was taken care of the best that that we that they could. Um, in a very <clears throat> excuse me, my allergies are crazy right now. Um, um, where everybody was taken care of the best they could um, in a very traditional way, um, and. It was um, something that was just like ingrained in me that I just I just saw it was a natural thing. It wasn't something that was forced upon me. Um, and uh, I I always knew that I wanted to cook. I loved to cook. Um, in Alaska, you have potlatches like here, um, but it's like a big three day event where it's everybody is fed for lunch or a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks. And so I was always in the kitchen helping out. Um, and it's a very communal thing where it's, nobody is like in charge like you would have in um, like a professional kitchen where it's the French brigade system. Um, it's, it's like an auntie, like, oh, you do it this way. And then another auntie comes up and tells you, oh, no, you do it this way. <laughs> and then another auntie, and it's just like, and you just, you learn that way. And then a grandma comes and tells you, you do it this way. And, and then you learn from that grandma. And then that grandma tells you, you know, trickles down that way. Um, and it's, it's, and that's how I learned how to cook. I eventually did go to culinary school here at Seattle Central. Um, but that's, that's where I got my love for cooking. That's where I got my love for food. Um, and I see the disparities between indigenous people and our food systems and f throughout history. And it breaks my heart. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm up here right now is because it's, it, it needs to be talked about. Thank you both. Um, so Latrice, I'll start with you here. I, I first reached out to you when I was researching this book because I was interested in learning more about regenerative grazing and this idea that in contrast to most contemporary cattle operations, native herbivores on this continent moved across the landscape and grazed in a way that actually stimulated vegetation to regrow and build up soil carbon. And you have experience with both cattle and native herbivores, and you've been studying the way their grazing impacts soil ecology. So what can you tell us about what you've learned? And I should also say, just update to the bio, Latrice just defended her master's degree, so we should all... <laughs> She is now um, Masters, Latrice Tatsy, MS, and so she may well know more about this than when we last talked. <laughs> you know, I, I consider myself a forever student um, just through our stories, and you know, what really brought me to my research is, you know, through our culture, my, we have relationships and we build relationships. And so when I first got into ranching cattle, I was born into it, but I, you know, I was just kind of to the side. And then my mother, we, I, my dad was like, all right, you guys are going to sell some cows, you know? And so we went to the sales market and there was this bum calf and she was so, I thought it, I did, it was 
it was a calf. I didn't know it was a boy or girl. And I was like, oh my gosh, mom, look at that calf. And I was like, please, my savings, like, or something. Like, I just want to start my herd. And so it was a bum calf. We brought it, umbilical cord was still wet. And my dad was like, Cassie, why did you buy Latrice that, that calf? Like, you know, it's not going to make it. It was just probably took off its mother, you know. And so, but I raised that calf. Like, I never was in 4-H or anything like that just because we were so secluded in the country. But for me, just building that relationship with that animal and, you know, kind of really, like, understanding it and growing up and being like, that's my pet cow. You want to go pet my cow? You know, all, my, all the cousins knew, like, that was Latrice's cow, you know. Okay. And so, you know, understanding, like, that my background and then also understanding my cultural background of, like, who I am and, like, my dad saying, like, okay, my girl, you know, we're going to ride over here. Here's a buffalo jump. Okay, my girl, like, look at these teepee rings. There used to be an agency here before our people moved to the current agency in, in Browning. So, like, knowing, like, my history and where I came from was really, like, the biggest thing. And so, yeah, as I got older and, and I started my, my degree in natural resources and rangeland ecology, and I was like, you know, grazing's really important. We live in a very agricultural part of, of you know, where grass is life, more or less, for, for our economy for our people and so you know as I went on to study that I was like okay this is really cool you know how can I give back and I felt kind of limited with what I could do with my bachelor's degree and so then I was like you know I want to go for my master's I, I worked with students I had student researchers when I was working at the tribal college and I was like you know I, I just really love research and so I was like what can I research you know and then the the reintroduction of bison has was really taking off and I was just like you know there there has to be more to that along with the cultural healing the cultural science like you know these animals have evolved with the land and what is that relationship is it something we could see within the first 20 to 30 years of their reintroduction is it something that we're going to see in 50 to 100 you know because we do not know what that relationship is, there's this research that's being developed. And so I was really curious of like, okay, when I, when I met with my advisor, he studies soil and I was like, okay, you know, how do I wanna study soil that I feel like I, I could benefit me as a student, but also my people and also, you know, reciprocate to being able to give back to my community. And so I was like, you know, what does the, the reintroduction of bison have to do with soil health and what is that relationship? And so, you know, the more I start reading about their grazing that I, you know, the information I had, the baseline is my undergrad and as, you know, I start developing more reading, I was like, you know, the relationship is powerful and and so, you know, what what can I see in that? You know, I was like, you, I could go do all these study sites on these, big national bison reserves, but I was like, is that really gonna give back to where I come from? And so I was like, it's not, because where I come from is where I gotta give back to, that's who I am as a person. So I talked to the the bison manager, the buffalo manager, Ine, and I was like, can I, can I study um, the buffalo? And he's like, all right, yeah. And so neighboring, the, the, um, the tribal herd is um, a cattle ranch. And so I've known that family. I've rodeoed with their kids. And I was like, you know, I'm not trying to pin them up against each other. I'm not trying to say cattle and bison, one's better than the other. What I'm trying to do is understand what their grazing relationship is with the soil. I was like, so I'd be honored if you let me take soil samples at your ranch alongside the, you know, because you guys border the, the the bison pasture, I was like, you know, you guys don't have, you know, you don't complain over brucellosis and a lot of the things that other, you know, ranchers um, in Montana deal with. And I was like, so can I just, and so they were so sweet. And so that's how my research project started. And I hired interns to, because I'm always like, you know, if I don't share what opportunities I have with the youth, then how am I really giving back? So when I first started my research project, I got in on some funding and I was like, cut it in half, ha I'll take half pay, hire some interns. And so we started what I do with Pecunny Lodge Health Institute is where we study regenerative grazing and how, you know, if you were to manage more like bison grazing where they move and, you know, um, 
kind of put them in like pasture paddocks with electric fence, the cattle, you know, how that would benefit. So we've, we've been trickling that down with my research and, you know, some of the things that we found is based on, you know, bison grazing is that they create like this diversity of plant species. And so, you know, I, with my data, I kind of found like they're the bison pastures sequestering more carbon. And so I'm not saying like the bison's the better grazer. What I'm saying is right now is I have baseline data. And so with the, with the ranchers um, on the other side, they're gonna be starting regenerative grazing and who's to say when they mimic what bison grazing is on the other side in 20 to 30 years that their their soil samples won't be similar to, to the bison because you know you have two different grazing types on what I like to call a metaphorical line, because if that fence line wasn't there, the animals wouldn't be separate. And so that's really how I view this. And so, you know, that really intrigued my research and my background and who I am. And I always kind of laugh because when I finished my graduate degree at more my cattle ranches, I always told my grandma, I was like, you know what, grandma, you know you see all your cows. And She's like, yeah, I was like, do, do you realize like one day I'm gonna have some buffalo out there? And she would just smile and laugh and be like, oh, Latrice, you're such a dreamer. And so last November, or this past November, I was doing some work with um, a filming crew and they were, so I told them my, the story and they're like, if we get you buffalo, will you take them? And I was like, you're kidding me. Like, <laughs> no way, what? Like, I don't have to like save up and, it, and you know, for me, it's been like the best thing because, I mean, it was so cold, like the water would freeze. And so like, I'm like bundled up and, you know, carrying my buffalo water and they're just like, have this mat of snow on them and they're just chilling, like they're fine in the like really harsh weather conditions. And then we're going to feed the cows and the poor cows are just standing there like freezing. And I'm like, okay, now, now I'm gonna like, I'm. I'm more like serious of like, I know the buffalo are more sustainable on the land because here my buffalo are just like, have that height of insulation with that snow and my poor cows are over there just shivering. I'm, I'm gonna keep both, but it really gives me a, an idea of like, who's more sustainable on the land, you know? So, <laughs> so that's a little bit about, you know, my research and why I come up with the project I did, so. Mm, that's it's such an incredibly powerful story. And I, I want to ask you one follow-up question, and then I want to bring Hillel in, and I want to talk a little bit more about food sovereignty. But I wanted to ask you this follow-up, because I've heard in a lot of regenerative grazing conversations throughout the country and sort of as part of you know climate conversations at the UN and these kinds of spaces, buffalo come up a lot. But I find that a lot of researchers often talk about them as a historical model. And so they'll say, well, we have this historical model of how buffalo used to graze on the landscape, and we can use that to inform contemporary cattle management. And I feel like there's this two really big missing pieces. One, the role of indigenous people in this land management system and, and people's relationships with buffalo, including things like fire that are part of that whole prairie system. Um, and two, you know, the work that you're doing, it's not just the idea that you look to the past, but it really is about bringing buffalo ini relatives home and that it's not just gonna be a historical model to inform cattle grazing, that they're gonna be there and you, I just will never forget, you told me like the buffalo are a teacher and they need to actually be physically present. So I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that approach, because I think that's a really important distinction. And I think, um, yeah, that's the form of regenerative grazing that we need to move towards. <laughs> oh, for, for sure. So, you know, for, in our culture, our people learned from the animals and it was, you know, they had that natural relationship with it. So for me, looking at regenerative grazing is just going back to the teacher. <laughs> and, you know, I'm the student. Yeah, you know, I was telling Liz, I was like, yeah, you know, I have my BS degree. And I was like, you know, kind of can't use that word. And then, <laughs> and then I was like, you know, now that I got my MS, I was like, I don't want to use that word. But, you know, I just, um, but no matter what degree I have, I will always learn more from those animals who have that relationship with the land. And it's not taking, you know, when they use the term historical text, it's, it's like we're, you know, they wanna look back to the past, but they forget we're present, we're here, 
we're, we're sitting here amongst you, we're sharing our, our knowledge and, you know, our voice. And I always share this with Liz. I was like, you know, historically, our people didn't get a place at the table. And they got a place, but they couldn't really say much. And then they got to start talking. But today, we, we, we get to be our own voice. And so for me, that's really important to share, like, you know, what I'm doing with my research and what we're doing with regenerative grazing on the Blackfeet Nation has to do with the teachings of our people and that cultural ideology and knowing that we come from the land and knowing that the health of the soil is gonna you know, be the effect of healthy or unhealthy plants. Those plants are gonna be the effect of you know, healthy or unhealthy animals. And so the way we manage it as a person, as people, we influence those cycles. And so knowing that that relationship is intricately tied to who we are as people, because in our creation stories that I had to go back and be like, why is soil so important? In our creation stories, if you look at, you know, Western Eurocentric science, you know, the Big Bang Theory, well, our story is that we come from Earth, we come from, from the ground, you know, and we return back to it, we come from it and we return. And so having that and knowing those relationships and how, how do we leave it healthier for the next generation? And so the way I look at it is the way that my father, he shares all the stories of his grandfather and the reason that he managed the land and knew that we had to have land that was close to the water for our cattle and knew, knowing that we had to move them and, you know, and when it was, and why they didn't hunt buffalo even though the numbers were really small because you know learning all those lessons and why they're tied to not taking more than you need and being sustainable and so i know you know that with, with food it, and you know with your resource when you have these natural resources it, you know for us for me like i always know you you don't take more than you need and so that was really applied to the grazing aspects of even the buffalo is the buffalo new like hey, you know, we are setting the stage for these other animals. We are a key don't, keystone species, you know? And so, and just having that relationship of they would graze and then you look at all these studies where different wildlife would come in and graze after, you know, any buffalo come in or, you know, start it. And you could look at different research, but it's just really tied to understanding what that relationship was, is with the animal and knowing that you're learning from them and to be thankful for what they're showing you because for me, when going back and looking at those animals, it's like almost ha relearning your history and relearning who you are as a person and, and having that cultural identity and having that identity tied to the animal. So it's, it's you know, more present day, but it's like, okay, I'm gonna take what you're, you're showing me and I wanna make sure that I help ranchers, whether they're cattle ranchers or you know, going into Buffalo that there's, there's a special way that you, you care for the land because we, we don't manage it for ourselves. Like my, my dad's grandparents, they always manage it for the next generation. And I say, you know, my dad doesn't manage it for me, he manages it for my kids. And so the changes that I'm gonna make with my education, I'm not doing it for my kids. So it's you always think generations down the road because that's who you're leaving the land for. Mm, thank you so much for all of these insights. Um, hello, I want to talk more about your experience um, sourcing, preparing, and serving these indigenous foods. And you talked a little bit about this, but I'm curious what got you started in doing this work as it went from being, you know, something you were drawn to when you were young to something that you now do as your work. Um, and what have been the most rewarding and the most challenging aspects of, of being an indigenous chef and serving indigenous food and kind of being an ambassador for indigenous foods? Oh, so easy questions. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, well, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things um, for that whole question. Um, so I started um, going to, um, let me rephrase. Growing up, 
I ate traditional foods of the Athabascan. I am Pawnee. We are from, my, my tribe is in Oklahoma. Um, we are originally from Kansas and Nebraska area. Um, we are one of the last tribes to be moved to a reservation. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, in the 70s, my dad came up to Oklahoma, or came from Oklahoma to Alaska to work on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline because he's a surveyor. And um, and and he just stayed. Um, <laughs> and but we we grew up in around Mentasta Lake Village, around the matriarch um, Katie John, who had 14 children who eight of them were taken away from her and put into boarding schools. And so um, boarding schools is a whole other topic that you all should definitely research um, because it's a tragic and horrific thing that has happened in this country and in Canada. Um, and she had kids taken away from her um, where they were not allowed to speak their language, uh, they had their hair cut, they had their clothes taken away, they were not allowed to eat traditional foods. Um, basically, uh, their whole identity was taken away from them. Um, the, the, the long and short of it was to kill the Indian, save the man, was the goal of those horrific um, schools. And, so when those kids came back, um, they couldn't even communicate. And to have that happen was horrific. And then many years later, the state of Alaska said <clears throat> that um, Alaska Native people were not allowed to um, hunt, fish, um, do anything with subsistence, living um, at all, you would get arrested. Uh, and so Katie John was like, uh, no, I think I've had enough of this. So in 1984, she decided to fight the state of Alaska, and that fight is still going on um, <laughs> because the state of Alaska is a jerk. And um, uh, she actually did win in the Ninth Circuit Supreme Court, um, but the state of Alaska just loves to keep fighting um, Native people. Um, but I was born in 1985, and so I watched that fight. Um, I saw people arrested for having hunted and fished in a subsistence way. Um, and, and saw her harassed um, and saw food taken away. Um, and those, those memories are just like burned into my brain and that's one of the reasons why I do what I do, is because food should never be taken away, no matter how you get it, um, especially in a hunting and subsistence way, <laughs> traditional way. Um, and so that really put like a fire in me, um, because, because how dare how, how dare the government? I mean, it does, but it's just like it just makes me angry. Um, and then I forget your other questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, as you've carried this work forward, what have been the rewarding aspects? What have been some of the challenging aspects? Do you feel like you continue to bump up against these structural barriers to indigenous food oh. sovereignty? Are there ways in which through your work you can you can sort of cultivate and bolster that indigenous food sovereignty? Yeah, um, some things that I have really like 
found difficult is actually being able to like source food because I try to get food for events from tribal people from either uh, the tribe itself or from like a tribal farmer or you know something like that um, and that is quite difficult because there are not a lot of tribal farmers there are not a lot of you know think you know people like that um, that are able to 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 source it out to other than you know a small group um, and so there there has been um, some people like um, like Ramona Farms in um, um, Arizona. They've been in business for gosh, I don't even know how long now. Fifty years, I think, um, and uh, and they they do beautiful, beautiful, all pueblo foods. It's gorgeous, gorgeous foods. Ramona Farms. I um, ordered their tapri <laughs> beans online. You should do it too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and then there's some like local places here that I work with, um, but it's it's difficult to to find tribally sourced food or tribal tribally owned food. Um, but when I do, I think that's like it's one of the best things because people are like, oh my gosh, you got this from where? You got this from who? <laughs> It's like, yeah, like we're, you know, we're only 3% of the population, but like our food is so much of what you eat, of so much in your pantry. Like, <laughs> and we just take away, um, just, I mean, just take away corn. Just imagine what the world food landscape would look like, or tomatoes, or chocolate, um, you know? <laughs> Just like <laughs> I know, me either. <laughs> just take, just take away, you know, take away those those what, three things, and just imagine, just for like a second, your pantries right now. How different would it look? Your medications, your, I mean, so many different things. With the corn byproduct. <laughs> um, so it's. It, yeah, that has that has been rewarding. Just just letting people know that that's out there. That yeah, this this food is out there. Hmm. I'm gonna start looking at the iPad with y'all's questions here. Um, but before I do that, I want to make sure that we don't forget. Um, what are ways that folks who are listening to this can support both the specific work that you're doing, if people want to connect and look up the work you're doing and how they can support it specifically, and also the larger work that you're both a part of. So you started mentioning um, some really awesome native food producers that we can all support, um, but I just want to give some space for each of you to offer us some, some action items, and then we'll start um, going to some questions. Um, I guess I'll go. <laughs> you know, for me, it's just um, investing in the in the community, the students um, is I what I see as the biggest benefit of the work that I'm sitting here getting to share. Um, because Liz has been a savior in hired student interns to do research for me when I wasn't able to be at MSU, and so they got to be a part of my work. You know, taking that pay cut, I got to hire student interns and give them the opportunity to be on the land. So even in my thesis, they were like, what would you do with money? And I was like, hire student interns? Like, what else would I do? You know, because for me, that that's just, you know, if on my platform if I'm able to help someone else, especially students who are finding their way in this world, you know, and creating their path. You know, if I could find ways to support that in any way, shape, or form, then that's, you know, what I'll do. And my internships, I'm like, I don't care if you're in psychology, I don't care if you're in agriculture, whatever. Like, I just, I want to give students the opportunity to be on the land. And so for me, that that's my platform is 
getting students on the land because that's what my dad did for me growing up, you know. He was like, get on this horse, you know, we're going to go be a part of this land because that's who we are. We're, we're not outside of the system. We're interconnected with the system. And so being able to share, share that knowledge through our science and through our cultural science with students is, you know, that's the biggest way to give back for me. Definitely. Um, definitely be a part of the community that is such a huge, huge, huge thing. Um, it's like if you want to know more about, you know, traditional foods or whatever, like the best part that you could do is, is be a part of the community that you're in. Um, uh, like go to Duwamish Longhouse every Saturday. They have a, every Saturday and Sunday, I believe now in the summer. Um, you can, uh, they have a market um, and it's different indigenous purveyors um, of sell all sorts of stuff. And, and you can buy earrings to food. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the Salish, um, Oh gosh, I forget the website. I think it's salishfoods.com. Um, uh, then there's Lakota Foods. Um, there's um, uh, Blue Mountain. Um, they do coffee. Um, there's, I mean, there's there's all sorts of indigenous-owned companies. Um, uh, oh gosh, what's that podcaster name? Um, Andy, um, do you know who I'm talking about? Oh, uh, yes. Girl, in I live Southwest. in the country. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be like looking out of my buffalo out my window. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> my podcast. <laughs> she's, she's like, she does a food podcast. I can't remember her name all of a sudden. Andy something in New Mexico, um, and uh, she made a list um, on her website of all of the different um, indigenous-owned uh, restaurants, caterers, food purveyors, farmers. Um, oh, gosh, what is it called? Um, that's, that's so annoying. Um, uh, yeah. It's like right, it's like right, I can see the logo. Um. I can see the picture. I uh -huh. can see your picture. Yeah. The vibe it's, is strong. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to work on this for y'all. <laughs> yeah, it'll come to me eventually, like when I walk out the doors. Um. Oh, yeah. That, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but she has a whole, like, it's a very, very cool thing that she put up um, uh, on her website. Yes, Andy Murphy. Thank Andy you. A N D I. Andy yeah. Murphy. <laughs> yeah, awesome. We we have a great question about favorite foods. What are your What are you? And Latrice and I got this question when we were in Missoula. So I'm particularly attracted to this question because I loved your answer. <laughs> um, so to both of you, what are some of your favorite native foods to eat and cook? Oh, some of some of my favorite native foods. Um, uh, it's dry fish. It's the Athabascan way of preserving salmon. Um, it's like super super smoky. Um, really, the way that it's done over um, really low. Uh, coals, high smoke, um, pine, um, and just smoke the fish over that, and it's, it's one of the best things in the world. Um, and Alaska blueberries. Yeah. Well, what you explained in fish terms, in my terms, is red meat, and we call that dry meat, and you smoke it the same way. 
but it's a byproduct. No, it's not a byproduct, but it's a part of like the bigger meat. I'm like, I'm a steak person. I love steak and prepared smoked. We call it dry meat. People call it jerky. That's another, like I'm a full on steak person. And it's just because like growing up, my dad would hunt. And so I would have wild game all the time. So I, I like grew up on red meat. And then as my diet changed, I was like, oh my gosh, like I could notice a difference in my body. So now I'm like going back to more of my like traditional of like red meat, but like healthier, you know, grazed red meat because I'm like, you know, our bodies evolved with it and I can't do salads because I'm not a rabbit, but you know, <laughs> so steak, <laughs> steak and red meat, that's my go-to. <laughs> I can't wait to walk into the like radical vegan podcast with you, Latrice. <laughs> <laughs> I also um, I want to give a shout out because there was a question about the cover, and we didn't mention the illustrator for this book is Patricia Wakita. She's an Oakland-based artist, and she's actually connected to um, the woman who's featured in the fourth chapter, who referred me to her. And so um, Patricia Wakita did the cover art, and there's also linoleum block prints um, represented inside the book for each of the chapters, um, including uh, a bison print that Patricia did. Um, and you can look her up. Her um, website is Wasabi Press, and she has an Etsy selling um, really inexpensive and accessible um, prints of, of all these illustrations on her Etsy store, as well as a lot of other awesome stuff. My house is like full of her art now. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to give that shout out. Um, this is a really great question. I appreciate this. This came in just a few seconds ago. Um, and I think this is for both of you. Do you have any concerns about sharing indigenous foods and practices with the mainstream and them losing their meaning or value? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exploitation is like something that indigenous communities are far too well familiar with. Yeah. You know, when it comes to um, where we had, you know, how they would call them ghost houses, but those were raided of the beadwork and stuff and then you know sharing of knowledge of resources how that was taken and so there there is the fear but then there's also the fear that if this knowledge isn't shared that it'll be lost and so you really have to find the balance of what's proper to share on the in the mainstream and what's proper to only share within your community and, w and within your people and so when you really find out what those balances are, it makes it easier because you know, like, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of my people as a whole, I'm speaking for myself. And so when you keep those things in mind, it keeps you more grounded and connected when you're sharing information. Exactly, I have to, all the time, I have to tell people like, I don't speak for the community, I don't speak for my tribe, I don't, I don't even speak for my family. I speak for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> so anything you hear out of my mouth is from me. It is not you. It is not this. It is not the Coast Salish community. It is. It is me. Um, if it's my research. It is my experiences. You know. It is. It's all of all of those types of things. Um, because, yeah, because of the exploitation um, and and things that have just happened, you know, in my life personally, that I've been like, oh man, I wish I hadn't have said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm like, shoot, it's now it's out there. It's too late. Can't like can't take it back now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, just, it's been a learning process. Yeah. yeah. Are there ways that you would encourage people to ask questions in a responsible manner with, with awareness of those kinds of distinctions as people, I mean, you're both people who get consulted a lot as experts on indigenous foods and indigenous food ways. What are the kinds of questions you appreciate? <laughs> and are there questions that you would encourage, you know, people not to ask? You know, for me, when you, when you ask 
an elder a question, just know like you're not gonna get a direct yes or no. You are gonna hear a story about why it is the way that it is. And so having that respect for them, taking the time to share that story in such a way that you're gonna get you know, the knowledge that you want, but understand it's just not gonna be like a, a direct Google question. Like you have to <laughs> invest your time and, and really be respectful within the knowledge because the knowledge that they're sharing has been passed down from generation to generation to generation, mm -hmm. and that's how we share who we are as a people and who we come from is is through those those stories and understanding that there, there's a greater lesson when you, when you hear these things. Yeah, yeah. Um, the in, indigenous way of of talking of giving knowledge um, is not linear. It is very circular <laughs> and like uh, all over the place. <laughs> it's like a story could start here. And then you're over here. And over here. <laughs> and, and over here. And then, yes. Liz, Liz got to experience that with me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like uh, one question could take, uh, and you, you know, you could think it's like a simple like yes or no, but it could take you like four hours mm -hmm. to get your answer. Um, so just, you know, be aware. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, oh, especially when dealing with an elder, um, always bring a gift. Yeah. Um, it's a very respectful thing to do. It doesn't have to be something big. It doesn't have to be something extravagant. It's a, it's a very respectful thing to do. It's a very traditional thing to do. Um, yeah. I feel like that's a really important thought underlying this whole conversation. <laughs> and even like what are the buffalo teaching about how we live with land and what is regeneration? Um, and actually the, the epigraph to this book, the sort of opening quote comes from Robin Wall Kimmerer's book. And one piece of it is always give a gift. Um, so I was really, really resonating with that. And we're gonna move to closing here. We're gonna offer some, some closing thoughts here. I'm gonna close with a short passage um, from the conclusion of the book. But I wonder um, if each of you wanna share some closing thoughts, like what should we take, take with us from this conversation? Um, I, I just hope that you take with you like a new hunger, um, something that has sparked within you and something that you maybe, I, I hope that you didn't know everything that, because I definitely didn't know everything that was set up here, <laughs> um, for sure. It's so funny when people call me an expert because I'm just like, what? <laughs> no, <laughs> not even a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, so, just just like a uh, a new hunger for for the knowledge that was shared today, um, because because there was some good stuff that the trees dropped. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, for me the. The thing that I want to give away is just for any little girl of color who is watching this in the future to be like, you know, those they went for it and they I have the same background. They look like me and look at what they're doing or look at what they did and, you know, inspire them and, and be, a, be a voice and just be able to be like, hey, look, we did it. This is what we went up against. But we're leveling the playing field more for you. And so, you know, that's the biggest takeaway is just providing a pathway where our ancestors have already went through and just continuing to follow that and make sure that we do that for future generations to come. Mm, thank you so much, both of you, for everything that you've shared this evening. And I am gonna close this out here with this passage from the end of Healing Grounds. All right. And um, 
There's a woman at the, featured in the last chapter named Stephanie Morningstar, an Oneida woman who works with the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. So you'll, you'll hear her referenced here. As I spoke with the trio of land justice advocates, I realized how fully my understanding of regenerative agriculture had shifted. In the beginning, I had pored over research papers about carbon sequestration and soil organic matter, trying to pin down the potential for agricultural climate solutions in technical terms. Then I'd started visiting farmers hoping to learn about the regenerative practices they were implementing to capture carbon and reduce emissions. But when it became clear to me that many of the communities with the strongest commitments to a regenerative food system were lacking access to land, I had to take a step back. It wasn't just individual farming practices standing in the way of agricultural climate solutions. It was our society's entire way of relating with land and with each other. The extraction of carbon from soils was just one integral piece of a much larger process of extraction, a process that included the theft of indigenous lands, the forced enslavement of millions of Africans, and the extortion of immigrant labor. To repair the soil, we needed to repair it all. I had been preoccupied with a narrow question. How many tons of carbon can farmers suck out of the atmosphere and store underground? Pinning down this number proved elusive as scientists pointed out the dizzying array of variables involved from soil types to crop varieties to the length of time you assumed a particular form of management would be sustained. Truthfully, they admitted, we're just beginning to understand how to measure the movement of this tiny consequential element. What we do know, however, is that carbon cycling works pretty well in healthy functioning ecosystems. Wondering if I'd failed to look at the most fundamental question underlying my whole project, I eventually asked Stephanie Morningstar a very unformed question. I'm sure the words didn't come out in this order, but the essence of it was this. So what is the climate crisis? I mean, really? This is ancestor work, Morningstar answered. Everything that we're doing is ancestor work. Not just me, not just black folks, not just people of color, everybody. Climate change signals a profound imbalance, Morningstar explained, rooted in the violent restructuring of relationships between people and land that lies at the very heart of this continent's history. This rupture disrupted the connections that make healthy functioning ecosystems possible, including the connections that weave humans into the fabric of a place. And that means the vital work of rebuilding soil carbon is inextricably woven together with the vital work of racial justice. What we are doing is we are healing our ancestral lineages, Morningstar clarified. It's about going back to the root issues indigenous land dispossession and enslavement. How do we write those relationships between our own communities so that we can heal those things in this healing ground? So healing the climate means healing land, I asked, trying to follow Morningstar's train of thought. And healing land means healing colonization? That's it, Morningstar said. That's the work. And so with that, I will say thank you to all of you who engaged with us this evening in the room and on Zoom, and a huge thanks to Latrice and Hillel. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. And thank you so much, everybody at Town Hall Seattle who made this happen. A great, big, amazing, awesome team. Shout out to Megan, Sarah, Faith, Candace, 
everybody else, um, and the folks who are here from the bookstore as well. And I'm going to hang out um, and sign books, so come on by. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.